Hey YouTube, this is City Prepping. In this video, we'll answer one of the common questions I get asked in the comments section of my videos is, what do you do if you have diabetes and there's an emergency or a prolonged grid down situation in which you can't get the medication you need to uh, treat your condition? So what I did is I reached out to Dr. Joe and Nurse Amy. They've been on my channel several times in the past. Uh, they're a very, very valuable resource to the prepper community. They provide information for individuals uh, specifically in regards to medical conditions or how to treat medical issues in an emergency situation. Now, if you haven't done so, I highly recommend you go out and check out their book, uh, pick one up on Amazon. Very, very valuable resource for those that are interested in learning how to treat difficult, uh, different medical situations that may come up. What I'll do is in this video, I'm gonna ask them a series of questions. I'm also asking Dr. Joe to share some personal information. I think it's very important that you listen to that before you skip ahead to the more in-depth information because you'll understand why, coming from his perspective, this is such an important thing to discuss. What I'll do is I'll open up the video with a quick introduction to Nurse Amy. She'll explain a little more about what they do, and I'll also put a link in the description section below if you want to check out their YouTube channel. On that note, here's Nurse Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Alton. I'm an advanced registered nurse practitioner, also known as Nurse Amy. And along with my husband, physician and surgeon Joe Alton, MD, we're the authors of the Survival Medicine Handbook, the essential guide for when medical help is not on the way, now in its third edition. Our new book, Alton's Antibiotics and Infectious Disease, The Layman's Guide to Available Antibacterials in Austere Settings, and the designer of an entire line of medical kits at store.doomandbloom.net. Our website at doomandbloom.net has over a thousand articles, podcasts, and videos on medical preparedness. Today, Dr. Alton will be discussing some tough questions on diabetes from our good friend, City Prepper. He'll answer these questions in plain English, not medical ease, but he'll be speaking about these things that are outside of the box. Most of it is hypothetical and pertains to circumstances where you're off the grid when there's no medical facility and no modern medicine, no ICU, no ER in which to take your patients. You are the highest asset left, not just today, but for the long haul. Without a crystal ball, who knows how long things will really go down in such a setting. And diabetics, especially those on insulin, will have more issues than others. All the answers are not in this video, so please feel free to add any constructive advice or personal experiences. Let's try to keep it positive though. Please remember insulin dependent diabetics deserve hope too. And also remember the sage advice. In survival scenarios, you do what you can, where you are, with what you have. So what I'd like to do now is go through a series of questions with Dr. Joe. And the first one is, what is diabetes and are there different types of diabetes? Diabetes is a chronic health problem that affects how your body turns food into energy. In diabetics, the body's ability either to produce or to respond to an important hormone is impaired, resulting in elevated levels of sugar, also called glucose, in the blood. Most of the food you eat is broken down into glucose and it's released into your bloodstream. When your blood sugar goes up, special cells in an organ known as the pancreas produce something called insulin. Insulin acts to allow your body cells to absorb glucose from the blood and use it as an energy source. When too much blood sugar stays in the circulation, it eventually causes damage to certain organs, especially the heart, the kidneys, and the eyes. There are two major types of diabetes, not including pregnancy-related diabetes, which we'll leave for another time. The CDC says that type 1 diabetes is likely caused by something called an autoimmune reaction, where the body is essentially attacking itself. In this case, damage occurs to the cells that are responsible for making insulin. Survival becomes dependent on an outside source of insulin in that case. This type of diabetes accounts for about 5% of cases and is usually first identified in young people. With type 2 diabetes, your body either produces some insulin but not enough or is resistant to it and can't maintain normal glucose levels. The grand majority of people with diabetes have type 2 and are usually diagnosed in adulthood. Like me, I have type 2 diabetes. Question number two is, what is your personal experience with diabetes? We have a strong family history of diabetes in my family, usually beginning in adulthood. The sole exception has been my youngest son. 
He was a healthy little boy until he started having trouble controlling his urination. That's a pretty big problem when you're eight years old. What tipped me off that his issues were related to diabetes was the strange smell to the urine related to chemicals called ketones. We immediately took him to be evaluated and at age eight, sure enough, he was found to be diabetic. This was a shock, even with the family history. How do you tell a child that age that he needs to inject himself, in this case, three times a day with insulin just to survive? The first few months, I would inject myself with sterile water at the same time that he did his insulin. No big deal. If dad can do it, I can too. And sure enough, he did get the hang of it pretty quickly. Problems occurred, however, when he hit his teen years. It isn't easy to be the only kid in your class that needs to take insulin injections. When he turned 18, he was sick of it all, and despite our objections, would test and inject himself a lot less often, and regularly only when he felt sick, or after a trip maybe to the ER for diabetic problems. By his mid-20s, both his kidneys and his eyes were giving out. Eventually, Kidney failure ensued and he began dialysis. He was left with only partial vision in one eye. The other one, totally dead, had to actually be removed and replaced with the glass eye when it started shrinking and looking abnormal. He continued dialysis for a year while waiting for a kidney to become available. Anyone who's been on a transplant list will understand what that's like. For many, this would have been the end of the road, but a tragedy occurred that intervened on his behalf. A healthy young father in his 30s was run over by a drunk driver while bicycling, and his kidney and part of his pancreas were transplanted into my son. The recovery wasn't easy. He had to go back to surgery twice due to internal bleeding before he finally stabilized. Today, although partially blind, he is actually producing insulin, and his transplanted kidney worked pretty darn well. Question number three is, if I have diabetes, what can I do to prepare for a potential grid down situation? Of course, it'll be difficult, if not impossible, to pinpoint the exact time when a full-blown disaster occurs that'll knock you off the grid. For type two, stockpiling your oral medications would be wise. In some cases, glucose control might be achieved simply with a healthy diet, normal weight for your height and age, and an active lifestyle. Mild type 2s, especially if they're obese to begin with, might actually improve if faced with the dietary restrictions and increased exertions related to activities of daily survival. Many diabetics are on some of the newer insulins, but in many states in the U.S., the old standards, regular and NPH insulin, don't require a prescription. So maybe you should get some for your storage if you can't get a good stockpile of the type of insulin you actually use. I'd like to refer to an article in offgridweb.net written by Dr. Dave Miller, a physician who has type 1 diabetes. I appreciated his insights and advice regarding diabetics off the grid. For the newer drugs, he suggests getting refills several days in advance. Do this every month to accumulate an extra supply of your insulin or for some type 2's oral anti-diabetic medications. Besides insulin, you're going to need a way to measure your glucose levels, especially important if you have to switch from one type of insulin to another. So have a glucometer, Dr. Miller actually says two, and plenty of test strips. Other supplies Dr. Miller recommends stocking up on would be syringes, a solar charger, batteries, glucose, and water purification equipment. If you're using an insulin pump, put together enough of those supplies. For the most longevity, keep your supplies, especially insulin and test strips, in a dry, cool place. Test strips may not be as accurate after their expiration dates, and it should be noted that some glucometers don't work at all with expired strips, something I found out the hard way. I think a little sign came up saying, test strips expired. Question number four is, how much insulin would I need to get me through a period of time when there may not be any available? That's a tough one. How long will the societal upheaval last? Is insulin still being commercially produced? Anywhere. Can it be stored properly? How much insulin do you need to give yourself on a daily basis? Can you depend on a diet that will prevent spikes and drops? 
In destabilized nations like Venezuela, type 1 diabetics are faced with these issues daily. Many type 1 diabetics no longer have access to test strips nor insulin. Heck, they barely have access to any food at all, let alone diabetic friendly food. There's no formula for type 1 diabetic survival that does not include insulin. Venezuelan diabetics are simply going without or taking less than what they need. Bottom line, always have extra vials in your medical storage. Question number five is, how do I store my insulin if there's no electricity? It's important for preparedness folk, whether they're diabetic or not, to have some way to produce power. Those taking insulin injections would be especially wise to have some way to run coolers for the drug. Solar chargers, batteries, these may work for the small cooler containers that are used to store vaccines and other medicines used in underdeveloped countries today. There are even solar and propane powered refrigerators on the market. It's important to remember that once the vial is opened, most common insulins will usually retain their potency for about 28 days at normal room temperature, depending on the type. Besides potency issues, remember that there's also the risk of contamination. According to the nation's insulin manufacturers, unopened insulin is best kept at about 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit and may last a good year or more from the date of purchase. Insulin's longevity at 100% potency is very sensitive, however, sunlight and extremely hot or cold temperatures will affect it. Eli Lilly, a pharmaceutical company that produces insulin, says that kept properly cooled, unopened insulin loses only 0.1% of potency over 30 days. That doesn't go for insulins that have changed in appearance though or that have been exposed to heat or freezing temperatures. They should be discarded. If you don't have a solar cooler, there may be other off-grid options. Some have suggested storing unopened vials in sealed containers in a cool water source or underground. Zier clay pot coolers or cold packs in massive quantities are some other options I've seen recommended. It's worth a shot if no other cooling options exist. Question number six is, can I ration my insulin? Taking less insulin than you should is certainly not conducive to a long, healthy life. A change in mindset may be required in off-grid settings where getting a fresh supply of insulin is just not an option. If the medicines are running out and no more are coming, perfect control is probably going to be difficult to achieve. Dr. Miller suggests, and I agree wholeheartedly, that you should probably shoot for a glucose of 180 to 200 instead. Your body will tolerate those levels for a longer period of time than it would tolerate, say, an attack of very low sugar, also called hypoglycemia. I'll admit that it's not impossible to have complications at a glucose of 180. That level, however, is lower than what's usually seen in the serious high sugar complication called diabetic ketoacidosis, also known as DKA. DKA is essentially a buildup of acids in your blood. It can happen when your blood sugar has been too high for too long. Usually, the levels are about 300, 350 or more when this happens. And this is what got my son into trouble on various occasions. You'll need test strips and a glucometer to figure out what amount of insulin would be sufficient to meet the new target levels of 180 to 200. Otherwise, you're just guessing. In times of trouble like we're seeing in Venezuela, these supplies aren't always available. Be sure to accumulate the materials you'll need well in advance to monitor your glucose levels. And question number seven is, how long would I live without insulin? Well, that is a very good question. It's clear to me that severe cases of type 1 diabetes will not last long without insulin. With a total lack of it, some would experience issues within 12 hours and deaths would probably start occurring within 3 to 10 days. That's why it's so important to keep a stockpile of properly stored unopened vials. It'll give your type 1s the best chance of reaching a point where society might restabilize. Now, some wonder about taking expired insulin. I've read anecdotal reports to the contrary on some diabetic forums, but I would think that potency would drop rapidly in open vials if they've been out in room temperature or higher, also if allowed to freeze. If unopened, it's possible that refrigerated insulin may last at a, maybe a reduced potency longer than the date that's listed. This is still problematic though, as it'll be impossible to know how degraded the expired insulin is. I saw a video recently from my friend Chris Weatherman, also known as Angry American, the post-apocalyptic author, 
and he has diabetic family members. He says that he stored a vial of insulin for a number of years under ideal conditions and that it was still viable when used. Your experience, of course, may vary. Bottom line, all bets are off with inspired insulin. You just don't know until you test its effect, like Chris did, and for that, you need the materials to measure your blood sugar. Hopefully this video gave you enough resources and information to begin to study this if you yourself have diabetes or someone you know or love. Obviously, in a grid down situation or an emergency where you may not be able to get access to the proper medication or you're concerned about how you would store it if there were no electricity, hopefully this video gives you ideas that you can begin to implement now to prepare. Again, I'll post a link in the description section below if you want to check out their YouTube channel and again, check out their book that you can pick up on Amazon. If you have any questions or any feedback, please post that in the comment section below. If you enjoyed the video, click on the like button, share on social media, and as always, be safe out there.